Welcome to the Legville Podcast. This is John Faithful Hamer. Today we're going to be talking with philosopher Jason Brennan about his forthcoming book, uh, When All Else Fails. It's a very fascinating book. He makes a strong argument for uh, the right of citizens to defend themselves against government agents, so police officers, you know, whatever, uh, and also to defend others in the moment. You know, been a lot of talk about this, especially in light of Black Lives Matter and things like that. Uh, it's a very, very timely argument. Uh, but before we get into that, a um, couple of things. Uh, to support the podcast, we could definitely use your support. There's a number of ways that you could do that. Uh, you could go and become a Patreon supporter uh, of the Likeville podcast. That's an obvious way to tangibly support us. Uh, you can also go and join our Facebook group. Uh, just enter Likeville and you'll find it. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at the Likeville pod. All right. Um, that's one way. This uh, podcast, this episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. It's also brought to you by our sponsors. We have a number of sponsors. The first one is Seb Furtado Photography. This is private online photography courses uh, for all levels, from people who don't know anything whatsoever uh, to people who have perhaps more familiarity with photography. Uh, Sebastian is a very, very skilled photographer. He's a professional photographer himself, but he's also a skilled teacher, and I've seen what he can do. I, in a friend of mine who is actually a machinist, he works on diesel engines, repairing them. And he decided to take up photography as a hobby on the weekends, something to do. And he took um, a couple of classes with Sebastian and his skill level has just, it's, it's unbelievable. So he'll teach you the nuts and bolts of how to use your tool, how to use your camera. But then he'll also teach you um, how to take really great photographs and then how to edit them afterwards in you know, whatever software program you're most comfortable with. Uh, today's episode is also brought to you by Good Mix Foods. Uh, this is fantastic stuff. I actually just um, ate some this morning, the uh, Good Mix Neo Blend Paleo. It's a mixture of seeds and nuts and coconut and all these things. Very, very delicious, very complicated flavors. You put it in uh, with yogurt. At least that's the way I always eat it. But you mix it in with some yogurt and it just is fantastic stuff. It's very, very delicious. It gives you um, really steady energy. I don't know. I'm not sure how to exactly describe it other than that. You're very full. I mean, not uncomfortably full, but you're sa satiated, right? Because, you know, there's some kinds of breakfasts you have. You have it, and then, you know, an hour later, you're absolutely ravenous, right? Even though you've stuffed yourself, right? I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but this is not like that. I can have this first thing in the morning, and I'm totally full until well after lunch. It's fantastic stuff. Um, so it's a uh, good mix. You can find it um, online. It's sold on Amazon.com. I think they're trying to get on Amazon.ca in Canada, but they're not quite there yet. But uh, today's episode is also brought to you by Elsa's Bar. Elsa's is a fantastic place in Plateau Montréal. If you're in Montreal, you probably already know what a great place this is. Uh, it's Many people consider it to be the best bar in all of Montreal. I definitely do. In fact, uh, my wife and I bought, <laughs> I mean, this is going to make us sound like total alcoholics, but uh, that, that's not true. But we, we bought our place in part because we loved the location for lots of reasons. But the fact that it was really close to Elsa's was definitely uh, a selling point. We live just uh, around the block from Elsa's. It's a fantastic place. So if you go, uh, as many of you have, make sure to tell them that uh, that we sent you. Oh, and also, if you get the Good Mix online, there's a coupon code for for us. I think it's... Sebastian, what is the coupon code for Good Mix? Anyway, we'll get that, we'll get that to you. They, but we have a coupon code where you can get, I think it's 10 or 15%. It's yeah, you think it's just Likeville? Yeah. Oh, so uh, if you put in Likeville 
as the coupon code, you can get, I think it's 10 or it's 15% off. So uh, definitely do that. Uh, today's episode is also brought to you by Café Lali and Carré des Artistes Galerie d'Art. This is a family-owned fine art gallery slash cafe in an amazing space in St. Henry. It's fantastic coffee, really nice um, ambiance surrounded by all sorts of fine art. It's not far from the Lachine Canal, um, not far from uh, the Atwater Market, uh, one of the neighborhoods in Montreal that's really sort of up and coming and you know exciting place to be. Uh, so we recommend you check that out as well if you're in Montreal. Uh, yeah, so uh, without further ado, I give you our interview with Jason Brennan. Welcome to the Like Fiddle podcast. This is John Faithful Hamer. Today we're going to be talking with philosopher Jason Brennan about his forthcoming book, When All Else Fails. Welcome, Jason. Thanks. Thanks for having me. What? Yeah, it's wonderful to hear your voice live. Finally, I've been—I've only known you uh, in sort of written form, your books and articles, and your posts in social media land and stuff like that. So, can you just uh, tell our listeners a little bit about this book? Sure. So the the book was a reaction, uh, in part, to a lot of the things that we're seeing on the news lately, where we're finding people, you know, government agents acting in very unjust ways. In particular, we see police officers beating and killing uh, uh, citizens, even after the citizens are clearly subdued or the citizens don't pose any kind of threat. Uh, and I was thinking about what are our obligations and what are we permitted to do in situations like that? So what I argue is that you are permitted to respond to government injustice exactly the same way you are permitted to respond to citizens acting unjustly, that you have a right to defend yourself and a right to defend others. And that right, the way that that right operates when some a private civilian is acting wrongly towards you is exactly the same as when a government agent is acting wrongly towards you. Yeah. So to take a, a an extreme example, which I mean, you, you have a lot of thought ex experiments. And I like the fact, by the way, that your thought experiments are clearly uh, sort of thinly based on actual events. You know, I can you sometimes in the notes, you you say what the event is. But even when you don't, it's pretty obvious to the reader <laughs> what you're talking about. Uh, but uh, so Let's say, to take an extreme example, let's say I have, uh, I have a gun, I'm in a state, I, I, I legally own a gun, I'm allowed to carry it, it's a state where I can carry it, um, in my jacket it's fine, I've got all my permits, and I come along and I turn the corner and I see like, you know, Rodney King getting beaten up by a bunch of police officers. Like, do I have the right to pull out my gun and tell them to stop immediately. And if they don't, you know, shoot one of them to make them stop. Yeah. I mean, so when we say if you have the right, legally speaking, it's an open question, depending on which state you're in, whether you have a legal right. And in most states, it would be very dangerous for you to do that. The police are likely to shoot back and call on a SWAT team to have you killed. So it might be imprudent to do it. But yeah. I'm arguing morally speaking, yes, you do have a right to do that. Um, now, when you if you come across police officers beating somebody up, and you don't know what's going on. You know there might be reasons to give them some benefit of the doubt, reasons to like gather information first. But if you were to watch the actual Rodney King beating, where it's clear at a certain point this person is subdued, he does not pose any threat to anyone, and they're continuing to injure him and beat him and smash him with batons, yeah. then at that point, yeah, you, you have the right to defend him from excessive violence. Um, and you treat it exactly the same way as if you were to see me do it. So I give an example in the book. You know, imagine that we're at a party together and one of uh, the, our fellow party goers, let's call him Rodney again. Rodney gets drunk. And because he gets drunk, he starts acting crazy. And he picks up one of the uh, tiki torches we have in the backyard and starts flailing it around and causing danger to everybody. In that kind of case, like it might make sense that people would try to stop him and they might even like throw him to the ground to get the fire out of his hand. Yeah. But once they have him on the ground, they can't just beat the crap out of him. Yeah. And it, yeah. No, I remember the, the first time I ever heard about the concept of sort of right of self-defense. I, I remember it. It was, I, I was a kid, I don't know, maybe like nine, 10 years old. And there was a situation where somebody was, it's kind of fuzzy. I should like Google it later on, but somebody had been 
like tried to mug somebody here in Montreal and the guy like turned got the knife or whatever it was out of the guy's hand and then just beat him like unconscious and like broke his like his his face in a number of places all the really really bad and so uh he got in trouble right he he was like charged with like aggravated assault and stuff like that and so there was a cop on tv on the six o'clock news and basically the the police the montreal police force went on a i guess like a you know, education campaign for like a about a week or so. And they went on and they said, OK, here's what the law is. If somebody is trying to like, you know, is trying to mug you, is trying to attack you, you have the right to defend yourself and you can use sufficient force to defend yourself. But once the person is down like on the ground and is no longer a threat to you, you have to stop. If you continue after that, uh, you're you'll be charged with assault. Yes. Right. Now, when I was reading your book, I thought, how wild would it be if there was a cop on the six o'clock news in Baltimore, where I, I lived for you know, a number of years in grad school, if a cop came on the news in six o'clock in Baltimore and said, okay, uh, if a cop is like, <laughs> as the other crowd, and like, uh, Cops are not allowed to go beyond this point. And if you see somebody, you can intervene and you can hit them back and you could do, I mean, that would be wild, but I've never even heard of such a thing. I mean, have you? No, uh, long ago, um, you know, when you think about the right of self-defense um, and the kind of rules regarding it, you have to think about how common law developed in English speaking countries. And without doing a, a huge amount of uh, talking about that, it ultimately comes from centuries and centuries of wandering judges that will hear cases and uh, the cases kind of go through this evolutionary mechanism where they reflect what are the common sense moral principles of generations after generations of normal people. And these rules kind of developed about that said that you had a right to defend yourself, including even against government agents, um, uh, that you could resist certain kinds of wrong action from them. But then, of course, when these things get put into statute law and codified, uh, what ends up happening is that government agents make exceptions for themselves. So what I'm arguing is that, morally speaking, there is no difference between government and private civilians when it comes to wrongdoing, and that whatever right you have against me, you have against a cop. So I think yeah. it, that's how we should think of it. We should think of it as police officers um, can subdue people when they're committing certain kinds of crimes, but they can't go beyond that. And there are lots and lots of cases, and they give some in the in the book about where it'll be something like a person. Actually, just the other day, uh, there was a case. I think it was actually here in Virginia, um, or uh, I'm, I'm in D.C. right now, but I live in Virginia. Uh, a case where uh, someone was having a stroke, and police officers came up, and they didn't know what was going on with him, so they busted his window and then tased him. Oh my god! Yeah, so they're not their first reaction is to hurt him. Wow! And in that kind of case, I'm like, if you saw that was going on and you knew that was happening, I think, yeah, you can shoot the cop to prevent him from doing that to that person. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is like sort of Black Panther territory. <laughs> you sound like almost like, you know, that that the response is that uh, minorities that are disproportionately experiencing state violence should arm themselves and should protect themselves. I mean, you would be in in favor of that. Yeah. So I want to distinguish a couple of different things. So this is a book about what I call defensive action. Defensive action is you are right now being subjected or someone that you know, or someone you see as being subjected to some sort of injustice, some sort of serious harm uh, or threat of serious harm. So you don't have to wait for someone to actually start getting beaten. It's enough that you can see that they're about to be hurt. And then a defensive action would be things like lying, deceiving, destroying property, or using violence against another person to stop them from committing that harm. That should be distinguished from things like violent revolution, walking around armed and patrolling the streets, punishing people after the fact. Those are all, those are not instances of defensive action. Yeah. So like if your cousin was shot by the police and you decide I'm going to you know, get back at the police as like a class and I'm just going to walk up to some random police car and like shoot two cops that are just sitting there having coffee. Like, that's not cool. No, it's, it's yeah. cool for a number of reasons. One is, even if those were the cops that committed the crime, um, you're now engaging in private punishment. Uh, and then there's a question about, are you ever allowed to engage in private punishment or should you use um, political systems to try to punish people? So I'm not talking about that in this book. Um, and secondly, if they're not the cops that did it, you're just harming other people. You know, so if I 
if uh you know you're in Montreal so if like some Canadians punched me in the face and I was mad at them it wouldn't make sense for me to go and then hurt two other random Canadians and be like you Canadians are all yeah right that holds for anything yeah well there's an interesting parallel to uh, I mean I'm sure you've thought of this already but the in a lot of Latin American countries and I think in Spain and Italy and a number of Latin countries they have this policy where if you like come in and find like your husband, like, you know, having sex with somebody else or like you, you catch your wife in bed with some dude, like you can, in the heat of the moment, if you like, you know, beat them severely, or even sometimes, even if you kill them, they will make uh, an exception, you know, either, either you'll be let off completely. I mean, it depends on the legal system, either you'll be let off completely or you'll have a, a lenient sentencing, but, and it's fascinating because if you find out that a dude is like sleeping with your wife and you sort of plot his murder and like, you know, go and kill him like, you know, a month later, two months later, then you're just, you're just a murderer. That's like first degree murder. And you'll be charged just like that. It, it's, it, I saw an interesting parallel to your idea that this has to be sort of in the heat of the moment. This is a situational thing where something's happening in real time and you can intervene to protect yourself or protect somebody else. And you're allowed to do it in that moment, but you can't, like you said, even if it's the same cops, you can't do it later on. Right. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I don't want to endorse the view that you should be allowed to like, uh, you know, say kill someone for, just because you catch them like uh, in coitus with your wife or something. No, no, I don't. I, I think that's barbaric and terrible. I don't, I don't agree. I'm just saying it's it in terms of the timing, there's an interesting analogy to the argument you're making. Right. right? So the idea here is that when, when, Certain countries have that kind of rule. They're thinking that um, it's a, some degree excusable because a reasonable person would have very high level of difficulty of resisting that. It's it's unreasonable to demand that people act perfectly peaceful when they catch someone uh, doing that kind of thing. Um, but with regard to defensive action, though, this is the idea that uh, the purpose of defensive action is simply to defend people. So you're you know that someone is posing a threat, and the threat doesn't have to be immediate. It can be something like if if terrorists declare um, we're going to bomb a school next week and like you reasonably believe that threat to be real, they really are going to do it. You can, you can attack them now. You don't have to wait until right before they drop the bomb. And so similarly, if um, I think of a government agency as making a credible threat, that they're going to commit an injustice. You can engage in certain kinds of defensive actions um, before they actually do it, but they have to have initiated it by creating a credible threat. Um, right. That's how violence works in general. The rules of self-defense um, um, that are codified into law allow for that kind of thing. Uh, if you're about to punch me, I don't have to wait, let you punch me first. And then <laughs> um, there's a yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can drop me first if you can like you're fast enough. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that makes so it's funny. I was I was at a dinner party last night and I was about at that point, I don't know, maybe like three quarters of the way through your book. And I, I was, you know, very excited about it. And so I was bringing it up and talking about the, and one of my friends, uh, his immediate objection uh, was like, well, you know, that, that's ridiculous because that would just lead to vigilantism and everybody taking the law into their, uh, their own hands. And they like, that's just, that would lead to total chaos. We need to have this idea that, you know, exactly what you go after, right? We, we need to have this idea that government agents have this magical force field around them and that they have this special status. And if we didn't have that, I mean, he sort of painted some sort of Hobbesian war of all against all, like it would be just complete chaos. I mean, you have a very, very interesting response to that objection. Can you sort of tell our listeners what it is? Yeah, good. Yeah, I call that the, um, oh, I forget the technical name that I gave that objection, but I cover it somewhere in chapter four. Uh, yeah. The, you know, the thought is supposed to be that, well, if we let people believe this, it's going to be dangerous. Now, two things. One is, I'm not arguing that you should decide the law for yourself. I'm saying that if certain conditions are in fact met, you may engage in defensive violence. I'm not saying that whenever you think a law is unjust, you may do whatever you want. That's, that's not the claim. But in response to that kind of claim, I say, I'm actually worried it goes the other way. <laughs> I love this. I love this. People are incredibly deferential to authority. Everyone <laughs> knows about things like the Milgram experiment, where it turns out that you can get almost anyone in the world to murder another person by telling them it's useful for science and by wearing a white lab coat. Yeah. Look throughout history. What you find is 
overwhelming deference to authority that yeah we're going to kill these jews because these people told us to and you think oh well they must have been under duress but if you actually go and read say biographies of prison guards and nazi concentration oh yeah ordinary uh, men that's a that's a scary book you know you find out the people working in the concentration camps weren't even anti-semitic most of them just that's what the law said um, yeah. Overwhelmingly, people are deferential to authority. Very, most people are cowards, and very few people will actually stand up to uh, wrongful authority. You find this kind of, if you just research the psychology behind this, you find this is pervasive, not simply when it comes to government, but in life in general. If their boss tells them to do something wrong, they'll do it, and then they'll make up an excuse about why they had to and why they, you know, they really didn't have any choice. Uh, my own colleagues, uh, I've, been, I've been working on a book about the bad business ethics of higher education. My own colleagues will see an injustice take place. Um, and then rather than stand up for it and defend somebody, they'll make up an excuse about why um, it would be really dangerous for them to do it when, in fact, there isn't any danger. So I think yeah. anything, um, people who defend the opposite point of view should keep their mouths quiet because the problem is they're promoting a psychology that's actually really dangerous. So someone like me would be a useful corrective to our overwhelming tendency to defer to wrongful authority. Yeah. And that actually dovetails, interestingly, with uh, the psychologist Philip Zimbardo. I mean, you're probably familiar with his stuff. He wrote The Lucifer Effect, you know, understanding how good people uh, become evil and stuff. like. It's a little bit of an undisciplined rambling book, but it's interesting stuff in there. And he, he says that what we need to do is sort of liberate uh, the minority of people in the human population who have naturally sort of heroic tendencies. So it's a very kind of platonic argument, you know, republic kind of argument that, that there's these people that are sort of the thematic ones, the spirited ones, and that if you can liberate them and get them used to the idea of behaving heroically, this will have a lot of positive benefits for society as a whole. So if if you could sort of get this idea out there that government agents don't have special status, then maybe you would have... You know, more heroes, <laughs> but but not. But you you basically say, and I, I thought that was very interesting because it reminded me of a sort of a Federalist Papers kind of argument. You know that, given what we know about human nature, uh, you're you're worrying about the the wrong direction. Right? It's going to be in the other direction. So that was one. I mean, what are some of your other uh, sort of responses to the vigilante charge? Good. Um, yeah. So one. Maybe it's really sort of just reciting the structure of the book in order to see how this vigilante argument comes up. Um, what, the book has a radical set of conclusions. I give a list of the kinds of things I think would be permissible. And I, I think these are permissible in the, in the United States in the past few years. They're not just hypothetical things. But all I'm arguing is two things. Your common sense view about de self-defense, whatever your view is about how you're allowed to defend yourself and others against civilians, plus the controversial claim is and treat government agents the same. Don't give them special status. So it's all about attacking the idea that they have special status. So one argument that people will give against my view, like against is the idea that you shouldn't engage in vigilante justice. And there's a couple problems with that. So first of all, the idea behind vigilanteism is when you have a stable and effective system, public system of justice in place, you should defer to that system and allow it to do its job. Um, the idea is that like when I if there's a bank robbery down the street, it doesn't make sense for me to intervene to stop it because the police are going to do a better job. I should defer to them. And that makes sense. Um, it also means you don't engage in private punishment. Um, so if even though I might know that O.J. Simpson was guilty of murder, if, you know, the, the, the state finds him um, not guilty, I should just let that pass, perhaps. Fair enough. But it doesn't really work in these cases of self-defense and defensive action. So I give examples like. Imagine that, um, first of all, if, if police are beating me for smoking pot and they're trying to kill me for doing that, when I defend myself, I'm not engaging in vigilante justice. I'm just trying to stop them from hurting me. Secondly, if you see something like uh, government agents are, are causing some kind of harm and then it's not clear why you have any reason to defer to them in the first place, but also they're um, like... In cases where no one is going to intervene, then you have the right to do so. So imagine like you see, say, a woman is being mugged and you call the police and they say, oh, no, we're not coming. It's going to take us 45 minutes to get there and we're on coffee break anyways. You don't have to say, well, I guess I can't intervene. You're allowed to go and defend that woman. Um, if the police say no, like so if you're allowed to do that in real life, then why wouldn't you be allowed to do that uh, with regard to government agents as well? So, I mean, one of the crazy conclusions that you have is it not only... You know, talking about police violence, but you also say that 
Uh, it's it's permissible. You have a right to lie to government officials, to sabotage, to leak, uh, to leak sort of WikiLeaks style. You know, if the government's doing kind of horrible Ill- illegal things, unethical things, you can leak it. So, how do you justify all those things? Yeah, well, I mean, again, the ultimate structure of the argument is um, to get start by giving a lot of cases involving civilians where the civilians are doing something wrong, um, and then I ask I ask the reader what would you think is permissible in this situation? And in those kinds of cases, they say, basically everyone I talk to says, oh, in this case would be permissible to destroy property. In this case would be permissible to lie. In this case would be permissible to sabotage or trick or give away information. And then I construct a parallel case, usually based on real life events involving government agents doing exactly the same thing. And I ask them, what's the difference? And they'll say, well, there's a government agent. I know know it's a government agent, but what is it about being a government agent that makes it so that you have an obligation to let them do these things? Whereas if a civilian did it, you would have um, the right to defend yourself or defend others. And then in effect, the person or the philosopher or whoever I'm, I'm talking to gives me a list of possible reasons that's supposed to show why they're different. And I go down those reasons one by one and just show that they don't work. Mm-hmm. So it's, well, it's, I mean, it's it's similar to, I think it's in the Republic. There's this one uh, discussion where they talk about, you know, lying and, if you have a if you have a friend who's sort of mentally unstable and they seem to be like in a really bad place and potentially they're going to hurt themselves or hurt somebody else and uh, they ask you to borrow like a weapon right or uh, let's and you it's completely just in that situation to lie to them right to say like oh i uh, i don't know where it is even though you know exactly where it is because um, you have a very credible belief that they're going to hurt themselves, right? right? And that would be permissive. So you could lie to a government official in exactly the same situation. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Almost everyone accepts the idea of the murder at the door type lying cases. Um, Except yeah. for Kant. My God, what a well, freak. Even Kant, I think, believes that. I think that's a, even a misreading of Kant. A lot of Kant scholars have told me that. When I was taking classes on Kant in grad school, that's kind of the, the view. Yeah, Susan Nyman goes at length in her what was her doctoral dissertation, which became her first book yeah. saying that that's a misreading of him. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. He was really saying something like you would be liable for certain legal out, like you would be legally liable for certain bad outcomes as a result of the lie, even though the lie might be permissible. Um, so yeah, almost everyone thinks like you can lie to the murder at the door. You can lie to other in situations where someone is going to use that information to commit harm and injustice. So does it change if it's a government agent? I don't think it does. So I, pay, I make arguments to the effect of it can be permissible for um, a politician to lie to voters in order to stop the voters from electing someone bad. So imagine it's uh, you have a really racist bunch of voters and they plan to elect a person who's going to reinstate Jim Crow. And the way that you stop them is you say, oh, no, I support Jim Crow, too. And then they elect you. And then when you're in power, you do the right thing, which is <laughs> undermine it. Um, I think, yeah, you should do that to voters. They have it coming. Um, imagine you're you're considering like providing, you know, there's a munitions company, like it's your government's engaging in an unjust war where they're going to hurt innocent people and they're contacting your business to provide munitions for them. I think it'd be permissible for you to lie and say you're going to provide high quality munitions and then sabotage those munitions so they don't work the way that Schindler supposedly did. Mm -hmm. Um, Take a job working at, say like, you're, you're about to be hired as a police officer or a member of the DEA, and they ask you during your application, will you follow the law even if you think it's unjust? You should say, yes, I absolutely will, and then do the right thing, which is break that law and not enforce it. As a jury member, if they ask, would you be willing to enforce uh, a conviction when you think the law is unjust? You should say, absolutely, and then engage in jury nullification. And the, the last chapter... <laughs> Like it's way. funny you mentioned that because, you know, I, I mentioned uh, John Abbott College, where I teach, has the largest police tech program in the province of Quebec. And so a lot of my former students are cops or they work in the uh, CSIS, which is like the Canadian equivalent of the CIA. And they or they work in you know various branches of law enforcement and stuff like that. And that actually what you just said, that is a trick question if you want to get into uh, a lot of these things. They're also in the military here too. They'll ask you, uh, "Would you follow uh, orders, even if like if they were unjust, or if you thought they like would you?" And if you answer yes, you're out, right? Because they because they really want you to know 
that in the post Nuremberg world, uh, I was just following orders does not wash. Like you're you're still responsible for uh, for what you do on the job, right? You can't just fall back on that that excuse. But maybe it's not like that everywhere. But but if it was like that, you said it's it's completely okay to to sort of lie to get. Right. And that's actually I asked a bunch of our listeners to sort of give questions that they wanted uh, asked of you. And I got a lot of questions, but it's funny because the first question I got was exactly what you just responded to. They said, what do you do if you have these sort of really kind of racist or xenophobic or, you know, you have these like voters, a lot of voters that want to sort of take away people's rights or want to infringe on in various ways. How do you manage a a majority in a democracy how do you manage a majority that is posing a threat to rights i mean how would you say that somebody should manage that yeah uh i mean i spent a lot of time writing about democratic theory in the past <laughs> yes you do <laughs> uh so you know uh, one of the early papers that led into this book was on this very point and i gave an example where Obama, when he was a candidate, was saying um, that he was going to renegotiate NAFTA in Ohio. Supposedly, it's not really clear if the story is true. Um, and then at the same time, Austin Goolsby, his uh, economic advisor at the time, a Chicago economist, was saying to was doing something in Canada, and he was saying to Canadian ministers, "No, no, he doesn't really mean it. Like he's just saying that to like get the voters to go along with it because he knows they're dumb." And and so this was kind of a scandal. Um, um, and I don't know if the story is true. I, I really tried researching it to find out if it's true or not. It's hard to verify. But I was, my direction is, if that is true, well, thanks, Obama. That's the right thing to do. Why should <laughs> you or me and my family suffer the consequences of dumb Ohio voters? They shouldn't be allowed to uh, impose unjust tariffs and protectionist policies on me. Um, and so if the way you stop them from doing that is by tricking them. Fair enough. They're liable to be deceived. Um, yeah. Not allowed to commit injustice just because it's a government action. Yeah. Well, it's harder and harder to do that. You know, these days you look at the Lincoln Douglas debates and Lincoln basically would say a different thing in a different town and often totally, you know, a different singing a different song to different audiences. You know, and if, if there was more of an anti-slavery crowd in this, you'd say some anti-slavery sort of things, you know, nods towards abolition. If uh, if you're talking to a more pro-slavery crowd, well, then you you know, sing a different tune. And you could, I think you could get away with that in the 19th century, but more and more with the gotcha politics and the internet and YouTube, now uh, it's harder and harder to do that. So how, how would you propose that a politician you know, lie for the greater good? Well, to be honest, I think you're right in a sense, it's easier to get caught, but getting caught doesn't matter as much as we think. And you can see that <laughs> uh, with Trump in the United States, uh, MSNBC and others are constantly pointing out how he's contradicting himself. And the reaction from his group, like the people who actually support him is they don't really pay attention. They don't really care. Uh, <laughs> and that's because we're so tribalistic that we, when it's a person on our side, then we don't care about contradictions. In fact, there's very strong studies on this very point. A guy named Drew Weston at Emory University in Atlanta published a famous study in, the, in 2008 um, where he would show people evidence of people being hypocritical. And what he found was if the person was on my side, even though I confront you with overwhelming evidence of hypocrisy, they go, no, no, he has an excuse. That's not really the same thing. And then if the person's on the other side, even if the evidence of their hypocrisy is really weak, you go, oh, of course they're hypocritical. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Getting... Have you ever read, uh, have you ever read this book? It's from the 1950s. This sort of the, the wild west days of social psychology before all the ethics review boards were brought in and stuff like that when they were just doing all sorts of crazy shit. But um, it's called When Prophecy Fails. No, you, ever, you ever read that? It's it's really freaky. These these social scientists basically infiltrated a cult in California that said that the end of the world was going to happen at, I don't know, like, like June 3rd, 1954 or some shit like that. Anyway, and they infiltrated this cult and they specifically wanted to understand what, what you're talking about. They wanted to know how do people sort of stick to their tribe or stick to their beliefs when there's all this evidence that it's bullshit, right? And how do they do it? And so they had a number of like hypotheses out there. They said, okay, well, maybe it, it's a function of IQ, right? So smarter people are more likely to sort of see the contradiction and change their minds. Stupider people are more likely to 
to sort of stick with the tribe. Well, that turned out to not be true. Then they they went through all these different sort of hypotheses, and the one that they ended up with is kind of creepy. They said it basically it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence or education or any of this stuff. It has to do with investment. How much have you invested? So people who lost a marriage like or, or a relationship because they joined this cult, those people are quite unlikely to... So they're going to believe all the rationalizations and explanations. People who've uh, given all of their savings to the cult leaders, to the, they're going to be uh, much more likely to buy into the rationalizations. People who've lost jobs. So it all has to do with investment. And people who are least invested in, they haven't sort of, uh, as Jesus says, you know, like, you know, leave everything and, you know, give away all your stuff to the poor and follow me. The people who've given up a lot for the cause, those are your true believers, right? So it's, uh, you know, I I think what you're saying is is very true. They're going to stick with it, right? But there's also, there's Ben Shapiro's theory, right? He says that, that basically Trump supporters, um, they knew exactly what they were getting into. And so... All this stuff about him, you know, with porn stars and playmates, like this is just not going to change their minds at all. They knew what they were paying for when they bought him. That's fascinating. Well, anecdotally, as an instance of that, um, I have some relatives where my uncle and aunt were anti-Iraq war. And then one of their children decided to join the military, which they're very surprised by because she was never kind of a pro-military person. She sent to Iraq and then they switched their tune and become pro-Iraq war. Um, And it wasn't it though in virtue of her, of their daughter um, becoming an enlisted person, that they suddenly acquired a bunch of insider information that justified the war to them. It was, my daughter might die for this, and I can't live with myself if she dies for an unjust cause, so I need to believe that this is like a worthwhile endeavor, that like what we're doing is worth it. Apologize to our listeners for the cutoff. The NSA keeps trying to, you know, prevent Jason and I from talking. It's it's terrible, but we're winning. So, uh, so Jay, you were saying why gotcha politics don't uh, don't work, right? And you say it's because of tribalism. Yeah, that's right. So voters, uh, you know, they they are only concerned. Like they don't really mind when their side lies. Uh, they don't really notice inconsistencies on their side. They often will just think that those accusations are unfair. It's kind of how we are in general. It's like when you when you're watching a sports game and they make a penalty call against your team, you you can actually see overwhelming evidence that the referee was right, but because it's against your team, you choose not to believe it. And in, I think in general, when it comes to politics, that's how our brains tend to work. Um, there's a common saying. I think you get this from like Robin Hanson, the economist uh, in George Mason University, that for most people, politics is not about policy. The purpose of holding a political belief is not to have a belief about how the world should work or even to advocate for a certain political policy. It's rather a way of signaling to other people in your group that you are a member of them and one of them. And the more expensive the belief in the sense of like the harder it is to hold it, the more absurd it is, the stronger you prove your loyalty, right? So people even ramp up their views. It might be the kind of thing where right after Trump gets elected in the United States, you know, I go online on election night and people make all of these apocalyptic predictions. They say, Trump is going to cause World War III. Trump is going to overturn Roe versus Wade and make abortion illegal in the United States. And then they try to one-up each other, make even more apocalyptic predictions. None of these people actually believe that. They knew it was bullshit. And I know they knew it because <laughs> I offered to bet them. I would say things, well, what do you, like, what do you mean by World War III? And they would give me an answer and say, well, I will bet you $5,000 that won't happen in the next 10 years. And they wouldn't take it because they don't actually believe it. What they were really doing is saying this stuff in order to impress their friends. And sometimes we believe things. We actually convince ourselves of it in order to impress our friends too. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the classic example of this for me is um, somebody like Roger Stone, right, who gets Richard Nixon tattooed on his back. I mean, like, that's talk about uh, really sort of costly signaling, you know, like like sort of it, it lets people on the right and conservatives know, like, not only do I endorse all of our sort of easy to sell sort of positions and and people and, you know, Reagan and all that stuff. I, I, I'm going to go in even for Nixon and I'm going to you know support Nixon and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, that kind of costly signaling, right? But do you think this is, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when I was reading your book is, I guess you're, you're probably familiar, this whole new idea. I don't know how useful it is, but they, first there was IQ and then they, they went to EQ and now they have this new thing, RQ, 
right? Which is uh, the rational quotient, which is there's some people who have high rational quotient and Jonathan Haidt, who we're actually going to be uh, interviewing next week, he argues that libertarians are sort of weird and in, they're weird in a number of ways. But one of the ways that they're weird is that they are in general very high in RQ, right? And people who are high in RQ tend to be lower on the tribalism uh, spectrum. Like they tend to be there. It's more possible to change their minds if you give them evidence. Right. I mean, do, do you buy that or do you think that's what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it is it's to some degree self-serving for me to think that uh, libertarians have higher RQ and all of that. Uh, but <laughs> not libertarian, not. I think you can detach yourself enough to respond to it. Yeah, I mean, other people who don't share my ideology are the ones that are doing this research saying that they are unusually rational. And I think, honestly, that that's part of what, what goes on with our moral thinking. And that's I think a lot of moral philosophy has a flavor of testing this very point, because most of us have a wide range of moral beliefs and political beliefs, but we are not able to hold all of those beliefs in our conscious thought at the same time. As a result, we have many contradictions inside of what we think, and philosophical arguments almost always take the form of, you think X, you also think Y, but X and Y, now that I'm pointing this out to you, they can't both be compatible, can they? So something's got to give, right? And really... In this book yeah. that I've just written, that's all I'm doing. I'm just saying, you probably believe that when you see a cop killing somebody that you have to defer to them. Or if not a cop killing somebody, you probably think that like uh, some other kind of case like that where governments are allowed to say criminalize marijuana and then you can't smoke it because they said no. And if they try to arrest you, you have to let them or whatever it might be. But you also think yeah. all of these other things about ethics and those, those other combination of things and these things can't go together. So something has to give. Um, and people don't like that because they don't really like testing the sort of consistency of their beliefs. Yeah. Well, in the in the opening parts of the book, you had that you know wonderful sort of introduction where you talk about sort of the founding of or the founding myth at least of philosophy with Socrates and you know all that stuff and uh, how he would go around and question people and, and realize that people didn't really know what they were talking about. So sort of people that were supposed to be very pious couldn't really explain what piety was and so on and so forth. And I immediately thought of uh, the essayist Nassim Nicholas Taleb in, <laughs> in his book, um, Anti-Fragile. He has this sort of funny little chapter in the middle of the book where he sets up this hypothetical dialogue between a character of his invention called Fat Tony, who's this sort of like very sort of intuitive, practical commonsensical Brooklyn guy with like a thick accent and he's very successful in business and uh, he sort of sees through bullshit, you know, very, very quickly. And so he, he has Fat Tony debate Socrates and Fat Tony just like rakes Socrates over the coals and he says, you know, this whole thing about how you have to know and be able to define things, uh, he says, that's bullshit. He said, like, there's, there's lots of people who are uh, perfectly honorable but they can't necessarily define what honor is. They're very loyal, but they can't define what loyalty is. And they're very pious and they can't. And that's fine. And by you trying to like get them to examine things, you actually just confuse them and get them into trouble. Right. And uh, I mean, I don't know. It's not exactly anti-intellectual, but it's, it's anti-Socratic uh, method to some extent. I mean, what do, what do you think about that objection to that philosophy get perhaps gets us into more trouble than than it helps us. Yeah, I think there's a lot to that. And I think even though I use that Socratic example, I don't really like Socrates very much. <laughs> no, that comes through in your other yeah, books. Socrates, yeah. Socrates has kind of a stupid method. And the reason is that he, he, or Plato in particular, I don't really know about Socrates, but Plato had this view that knowledge required knowledge of definitions. And that's a really controversial view about how knowledge works. Um, the case I like to give is, Almost anyone in the world can um, separate cats from dogs with near perfect accuracy. Even if you've had no special training in veter and like veterinarianism or uh, 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 biology, you're oh, you can get ninety nine point nine 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 percent of cases of cats versus dogs perfect, right? And if I ask you to define, yeah. how, give a definition for the word cat, you can't really give a definition. It's not something that admits of necessary and sufficient conditions. It's just not how the concept works. Um, so Socrates was asking the wrong question. What I what I do like, though, about Socrates, uh, even though those questions are dumb, 
is his tendency to say, well, you think this thing and you think this other thing, they're incompatible. Which is it? And so unlike Socrates, who I think was undermining common sense in order to get people to believe in spectacular mystical things, I think of myself as purging, like defending common sense by purging the bad parts of common sense using the good parts of common sense. You know, so I have yeah. this radical book. Like, yeah, you can you could shoot a president to stop him from starting it up. <laughs> you can join uh, the CIA with the purpose of undermining its wrongful activities. Um, you can do all these other things. You can be a Supreme Court justice and uh, um, lie about what the Constitution says in order to prevent the government from doing something unjust. Um, so what you're saying about the, the Socratic method and you know, what you like about it, rather than sort of obsessing over definitions and stuff like that, is the idea that you can point out that uh, you know, what you believe over here is not consistent with what you believe over here and to try and get people to, I don't know, I guess, shame people into some kind of consistency. And I, I can definitely think of so many ways in which this is a, a good thing and this can make somebody live a more ethical life, a more sort of aware life. But th the thing that's always bugged me about that method is that I can also think about ways in which it can actually make somebody more of a shitty person, you know, like because some of the most decent people I know are decent precisely because they're inconsistent. They don't take their beliefs to their logical conclusion. And, and some of the most monstrous people that I've known have been people who were extremely consistent, you know, like sort of uh, fundamentalists of all stripes that are the kind of people that are willing to uh, you know, to take a sort of biblical example, the kind of person that's willing to sacrifice their son, you know, to their God, you know, whether you define that God as like the communist utopia or, you know, whatever their racial politics or some, you know, whatever, it could be anything. But the, the kind of people who are willing to sacrifice the son, and those are usually very consistent people. So I, I just I'm wondering, how, how do you resolve that yourself? No, that, you're absolutely right. Consistency is not consistency is a virtue for virtuous people and a vice for and no, consistency is a virtue for virtuous people and a vice for vicious people. So uh, you think about, like, say, Deng Xiaoping in China in 1979, and he was not a very good communist. Thank goodness he wasn't, because lots of people benefited from him not really being willing to follow the ideology he supposedly espouses. Um, whereas, you know, someone like Mao, who was willing to take it to the limit, that's bad. So, yeah, if uh, the goal here is certainly not to make people um, become fundamentalist. Uh, it's if, if what you do with the, I mean, that's really the problem with any kind of argument or philosophical method or anything. Um, you can point out conflicts in people's beliefs and they have to somehow resolve them. But if they resolve them in favor of the dumb stuff or the bad <laughs> stuff, then we just made them worse. And, and by the way, yeah. there's, there's no evidence that, say, people who study moral philosophy uh, are unusually good people. Um, you know, maybe college professors in general might be slightly more ethical than the average person. There's a little bit of evidence of that. Or there's a little bit of evidence that, like, certain more intellectual people are more ethical. That's probably an IQ effect. Uh, IQ has a tendency to make people behave better, but there's not evidence that say moral philosophers are better than other people. If anything, they tend to be rather hypocritical. Um, you go and search, <laughs> this is a real thing. You survey them and you ask, do you think meat eating is wrong? And they're overwhelmingly will say yes. And then you survey them 10 minutes later and say, how many of you had meat for dinner last night? And they overwhelmingly will say, yes, we did. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very true. <laughs> yeah, I because that I mean this is something that I wrestle with in terms of that technique because I I can imagine so many scenarios where by somebody becoming you know one example just from my my family right I have a, a close family member who I, I love very very much and uh, and he's a very very devout uh, fundamentalist evangelical Christian right and, and he lives in the states and. Uh, everything about his beliefs and his church says that homosexuality is totally wrong and it's like a bad thing. But when his kid came out, my cousin, he completely loves and accepts him and loves and accepts his, uh, his husband, well, boyfriend and then now a husband. And he, he's inconsistent. Right. But Ed, but that's actually making him like a really decent dude. That's like making him like a, like a good father and like a, a nice person. Right. If he was more of a consistent 
uh, Christian, he would, you know, do like what I've seen some of my friends who grew up Jehovah's Witness, right? Where if they like fall away from the faith, they get shunned, you know, by their, their own parents won't pick up their phone. And, you know, you look at like what happens in these horrible totalitarian states where kids are turning in their parents and stuff like that. So, yeah, being inconsistent often makes people quite ethical. Right? So, yes. Yeah. So should we really be, uh, you know, having this method to students where we we teach them how to be more consistent? <laughs> I don't know. I I don't. I mean, I do it. I do it because that, that's my job. But I'm. I definitely am not always. I'm not always sure if it's if it's a good thing, right? Yeah. I, to be honest, I think we don't have much of a choice, and this isn't even a special method for philosophy. It's really how all thinking works. Uh, a scientific method is often, hey, we have this belief that. Uh, this particular object had these properties, but then we did this experiment and we had these observations which are inconsistent with that belief. What do you want to do about that? <laughs> right? That's 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 all thinking yeah. is. Is it's, it's all every argument is a consistency argument. That's all they are. Um, the problem, of course, is that arguments can lead us astray and they can lead us in the right direction. Um, so the question is whether whether my book is doing the bad version or the good version. You know, I certainly think people are going to a lot of people are going to think it's doing the bad version. They're saying, oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I have the opposite reaction. You're gonna like, get you're I gonna get understand. slammed for this, Jason. Oh my God. Yeah. I can't. I, my reaction is always like, I can't understand why all you decent people make exceptions for all for all these other people doing horrible things. All these horrible things done by governments throughout history, and you know that they're wrong. Like you're saying that they're wrong, and your action is, well, even though we know what they're doing is wrong, we still have to let them do it. And then I'm like, well, why? Why yeah. do we have to let them do it? And they give me a list, and I go through that list in the book and I go, okay, here's your, here's your argument. And here's a bunch of cases where you wouldn't think that argument holds. So that's not your real argument, is it? Yeah. Uh, I, I think they, I think not. they basically, my impression is that when it comes down to it, they all have a kind of dime store Hobbesianism. They have like this sort of, you know, it's not very well articulated, but perhaps the, the best articulated version I've seen is in somebody like Steven Pinker, you know, where he says, we basically need to have a sovereign and you need to have like a, a strong okay. state. And a, even an unjust state is better than no state. And we need to have like basically some bully in charge that's going to make the trains run on time. And I mean, this is his argument, which Nassim Nicholas Taleb, like, absolutely hates him for uh, his argument in like uh, the better angels of our nature why violence has declined and he, he says it's an incredibly pro-state uh, book right but and he says that even the most unjust states um, make life much better for their citizens than not having a state which i yeah. i imagine for you as a libertarian is like like fucking kryptonite right so well he he might be right i mean uh Many forms of actually existing anarchism have been disaster, have been disastrous, even though I'm a person who will often push certain kinds of anarchist ideas. I admit that, like, uh, there have been a lot of disastrous versions of anarchism. Uh, I mean, societies have never really been anarchistic because even like thousands of years ago, we're talking about uh, tribal societies that have an internal governance mechanism. And what's disastrous about them is that they war so much with the other tribes. Um, and, you know, states have done something to suppress that uh, and overall levels of of person on person killing are lower now, even in the 20th century than they were thousands of years earlier. But that said, it's not as though we have only two options, you know, option A, like the bad form of anarchy, war of all against all and option B, we just let the state do whatever it wants. There's a third option, which is we have states, maybe even strong states, but we feel free to resist in various ways when they act wrongly. And that's not to say we overthrow the state. I mean, this is not this is not a book advocating political reform. It's not a book about what the law should be. It's not a book about social change. It's really just a book about if you see are in a position to stop an injustice, you have permission to do so. Yeah, I'm going to make a prediction right now. My prediction is at least one of the first 10 reviews of your book is going to claim that this is an argument in favor of revolution. Even though, oh, yeah. even though you say, uh, I, I remember like one, two, three, four, at least five or six times you say explicitly, this is not what this is. And then the substance of it doesn't support that. But I, I bet people are going to say this is an argument in favor of revolution. I mean, I, oh, <laughs> I mean how, how are you going to deal with that? You're just going to like let it go or? Yeah, I, 
it's going to be how it works. It's how it's always how it works. I, you know, I wrote a, I had a, a New York Times op-ed that was saying, well, compulsory voting is a bad idea, but it wouldn't be a disaster. And then when the editors, you know, editors always create the titles, yeah. their title that they gave it was compulsory voting would be a disaster. You know, it's literally <laughs> the opposite of what my concluding <laughs> sentence was. Uh, I've had some other books and people do exactly that kind of thing. It'll be page one. It'll be, hey, just to make clear, I'm not saying X, I'm saying Y. And then everyone's like, oh, this guy says X. Yeah, and okay. the uh, Against Democracy was the most scandalously misrepresented <laughs> one. That Because yeah. uh, th- what people told me that book was about and then what it actually was about when I read it was uh, very, very different. <laughs> like, can you actually just, just you know, I, I definitely have like more questions about your forthcoming book, but can you just sort of briefly sketch out what your argument was there as a kind of, you know, public education thing for all the people that have wrong ideas about it? What is the basic argument of Against Democracy? Yeah, Against Democracy is trying to convince you that uh, political systems are tools. They're not just in and of themselves. What We should judge them based upon how good their consequences are, um, whether they protect rights and produce other kinds of good outcomes. Democracy is the best system we've had so far, and it might be the best system we can do, but it has systematic pathologies. It incentivizes uh, c- citizens to be ignorant, irrational, and biased. They vote accordingly, and as a result, we get certain really bad things happen in government that don't need to happen, wouldn't happen if only we were better informed and thought more rationally. So I argue we should be open to experimenting with certain kinds of political systems where we weigh votes according to knowledge in order to generate better kinds of outcomes. Uh, That's it. It's just, hey, maybe we can make democracy a bit better by doing a kind of weighted voting system. Um, And of course, then people think that it's all these other horrible things. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I was told about the book. Oh, my God, this this guy's basically talking about bringing back, you know, these sort of laws that they had in the South to disenfranchise blacks and stuff like that into poor people and having these, you know, li- literacy requirements and, you know, these tests, which will be totally rigged by the powers that be to sort of disenfranchise particular populations and you know all this i mean you that's not what you're saying (laughs) no i mean in principle and i do say in the book in principle i'd be open to some of those rules that they were enforced consistently like there's actually evidence that if you took the jim crow literacy and voter knowledge tests and you actually made white people take them then jim crow would have gone (laughs) away faster like the problem wasn't that they gave them to all the black people the problem was they didn't make the white people take them well, uh, that's so not that's not entirely that, true. Not South Carolina, that South Carolina, there's a uh, what's the name of that book? It's one of yours. Manisha Sinha wrote it anyway. But it, it, she says that it, that actually in South Carolina, those literacy requirements were a way of disenfranchising poor whites as well as uh, blacks. And so it, it did. They actually did apply it uh, across the board, and it was a way of just you know ensuring planter rule even after the abolition of slavery for a really long time so it disenfranchised like the vast majority of of people right yeah yeah Yeah, i mean you would have to put numeracy right as well as literacy if you're gonna because most of i mean what they've just they're changing the education system up here right now and they're putting in statistics um, into lower and lower grades, like into high school and in elementary school, because they've realized, like, if you're going to be an intelligent citizen in this day and age, and if you don't understand statistics, you can just be totally snowed. Yeah. So easily. I mean, so what would what kind of things would you be in favor of of doing? The thing, yeah, the, the thing I'd like to experiment with is what I call um, government by simulated oracle. And the way government by simulated oracle works is everyone gets to vote, including children. There's no reason to exclude them on this system. When you vote, though, you do three things. The first thing you do is you tell us who you are. We anonymously code your demographic information um, because that affects your voting behavior. And we need to worry about the influence that that might have on your vote. The second thing we do is we give you a test of basic political knowledge, really simple stuff. Can you name the prime minister of Canada? Can you identify which party uh, controls parliament? Can you identify some major laws that have been passed? Can you identify some statistics about like the unemployment rate and so on? Do you just know even the basics about what's going on? And then the third thing we do is we ask what you want. So we now know who you are, what you know, and what you want. When we get all of that data together from all sorts of people around the country voting, 
you can then calculate using really kind of second semester graduate statistics what the public would have voted for if it were fully informed. You can simulate a, a demographically identical public voting and you can even check for things like are they voting this way because they're white because they're rich because they're black or because they know we can we can actually this is how we figure out what knowledge does to what we what we want this is a method that's been used in political science for decades to, to estimate the effects of things like knowledge the effects of things like demographics the big question then is like well who decides what gets to go on this basic knowledge exam and this may sound paradoxical but i think you let democracy decide it um, before the election takes place, you randomly select, say, 500 citizens, you pay them and, and have some rules in place to protect their jobs, and they get to decide what knowledge do we think voters ought to have that we're going to use to weigh votes in this kind of system. That might seem weird because you think if they know what they should know, why don't they know that stuff? But in reality, they don't. If you ask the average person, what are the kinds of things a person ought to know in order to be an informed voter? And they'll give you a list that's very similar to the list I would give. If you then ask most people, well, do you actually know that stuff? They don't. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, like, you know, you have a, you have a, if you're failing algebra, you're like, well, I kind of know that there's this thing called algebra and I'm supposed to know it, but I don't actually have any ability to do algebra. Um, people, People think that voters ought to have certain kinds of knowledge, even though voters don't, in fact, have it. Yeah, I, I would if I had to make a list of that kind of stuff, I, I would say because one thing I've noticed moving through different um, sort of class groups and in my lifetime, I grew up in a working class neighborhood and there was this expression I heard all the time growing up. If you got money, you stole it. Right. And that was like the that was and that's a very common working class sort of myth that basically if you if you have money it's because you you stole it somehow you expropriated it from like from somebody you stole from somebody yep. right and then when i actually uh, sort of got older and i i met some you know entrepreneurs and business people and stuff like that i i found out that actually there were i met lots of people who were very very wealthy who'd made like significant fortunes including you know my my uncle who made their money totally clean <laughs> and they actually like they created wealth in a very ethical way they didn't screw anybody over in fact they they made the world better right so and then i saw other people that did make their money in, in a dirty way right so i there's these myths that i think depending upon where you come from you know same thing right on the on the upper end of the spectrum uh, if you're the upper middle class and if you grow up rich, you probably have some myths about what the causes of poverty are, right? You have some like ideas that are pretty wacky about why poor people are poor. You think, oh, it's because they're spending all their money on beer and cigarettes and scratch tickets and stuff like that, which, of course, is why some people are poor. But it's, it's not why all people are poor, right? So I, if there was a way to sort of educate people about how markets work and how poverty works, like that would be really great right yeah. but that would undermine most of the major parties in the west which are, yeah. are which are reliant on these myths right yeah they're they're giving you competing uh views prejudicial views they they get up and they the, the one thing i think you were talking about consistency earlier and the good thing about parties is that they often will say all the stuff during election season and then not stick to it you know they'll <laughs> They'll say things like, oh, well, we're just going to tax the rich even more and we're going to you know, put in these policies that will stop all this injustice. And then when they take power, they don't do it because they know better. They're, those The people running the show, um, they know a couple things. One is the voters aren't going to pay very close attention so they don't have to keep their promises. And two, well, they're educated and they're elite, so they know that the things they were saying are stupid and they can't actually do them, <laughs> right? So, you know, Obama might know that it's good to, like, talk protectionism in Ohio, but he knows better than to actually do that. Are you kidding? That would be idiotic. Uh, <laughs> it would hurt the very people he's supposed, supposedly trying to help, but they don't know that. Yeah. The thing is, you know, I, I think most the most common reaction I get from people who actually read Against Democracy and read it charitably, um, which means, you know, it, like, give with any degree of care, is, well, why don't we just educate voters instead? Why don't do that? And there, I think the, it's a misunderstanding. It's about the incentives that voters face. Most people, by the time they graduate from high school, have received the knowledge or have been exposed to the kinds of information that they need to be a good voter. It would be great if they took more economics. It would be great if they had some statistics. We should probably do, I think, Canada's right to replace uh, a lot of higher math with statistics. Um, 
it would be great if we replaced some of our like English literature classes with some social science classes. But even if we did that, it's not going to help because the problem is people retain information only if they find it interesting or useful. Most people don't find that information interesting. And as voters, it's not useful. Your vote doesn't matter. My vote doesn't matter. I'm we're both liberated to vote for the biggest mistake possible because the chances of your vote making a difference are so small. Yeah. So as a result, um, when you actually study like the effect of education on people's political knowledge, it's really weak. Uh, in the United States, the Pew polling company will give a battery, usually about 18 questions every like year or so asking voters like citizens what they know. Uh, and what they'll find is that going from having a high school diploma to having, um, a bachelor's degree predicts you get just less than one extra question right. That's the effect of four years of college. Maybe you'll get one more question right. Yeah. What predict the only thing that really predicts that you know a lot are two things: IQ. IQ predicts better knowledge, and um, interest is the real driver. If I ask you, do you think politics is interesting? Then that predicts you'll get twelve extra questions right. If I ask you, if you say it's boring, then you get fewer questions. Wow. Well, it, J- Jonathan Height. Jonathan Height makes an even stronger claim than what you're saying. I mean, in his book, uh, what is it? The The Righteous Mind: Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. He says that actually education uh, it tends to actually make you much better able to rationalize your political views. And he, give, he gives this wonderful example where he says, uh, if you go to people uh, of different political persuasions and different IQ levels and different education levels, and you ask them, uh, you know, on any issue, uh, whatever, gun, gun control, uh, abortion, you know, free trade, whatever it is, and you say, well, take a position, you know, what, what do you think about this, right? And then you ask them, well, give me uh, how many reasons can you give for why this is a why your position is right well somebody with a sort of low end low end of normal iq uh, so high school education um, they'll usually be able to come up with about two or three arguments for why you know their position is right right and then if you ask them you say okay now i want you to imagine somebody who thinks the opposite thing and how many can you think of any argument that would sort of support the other side? And they can usually come up with, you know, that same person, low end IQ, high school education. They can come up with, you know, maybe like two, three arguments that they think the other side, you know, would buy into. But here's the crazy effect that that he, he argues. If you look at somebody who has a higher IQ, more education, they will be able to, if you get at the high end of IQ with a PhD, they will usually be able to come up with about 10 to 12 reasons to support their position. But guess how many they can come up for the other side? Two or three. Zero. Two or three. So there's no change. So basically, the more educated you get, the more uh, intelligent, higher your IQ, you just become better at rationalizing your own bullshit. <laughs> like, you get you get better at rationalizing positions that you've probably come to for sort of tribal or emotional reasons or experiential <laughs> reasons, and you're just better at rationalizing that stuff. And, yes. uh, and I mean, it's an incredibly depressing finding. And he, he basically says the only thing that can save us is is this thing called RQ, that, you know, that if you encourage people to develop RQ. RQ is is the ability to think of uh, arguments for the other side. So somebody with a high RQ, which he says libertarians are bizarrely high on this, they can actually come up with a lot of reasons for the other, why the other side, I mean, they don't agree with the other side, but they can think of like five, six, seven good arguments for the other side, right? And he says, that's the only hope if you want to have, you know, a, a sort of put an end to a little bit of the tribalism and all that stuff but yeah, yeah. i mean i i saw you know that famous it's been attributed to so many different people winston churchill you know the democracy is the uh the worst the best the worst for is a terrible form of government but it's better than all the others or how does it go it's the worst form of government except all the others that have been tri- tried from time to time yeah well when i when i assigned against democracy to a class i basically said this is a book length sort of uh, elucidation of that aphorism. <laughs> so yeah. It's sort of you're explaining precisely why it's terrible, but you're never once saying, you know, the others are better. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's nowhere in there. Right. But so a- another question some listeners asked about uh, your new book, obviously they're just basing it on, you know, what they've seen little tidbits here and there, but I uh, say, well, what about the weather underground? What about the weathermen? You know, are, would you say that they were responding? Because I think it was in 2002, there was that documentary that came out on the weathermen. And I, I remember seeing it with friends while I was in the theater still. And I was immediately thinking about that documentary in the first chapter of your book. And I, I went back to it in my head a couple of times because what these people who are you know part of the weather underground say they're being interviewed right it's like sort of they're all balding aging hippies at this point right but like uh, they're interviewing them and they say we were doing everything that you're supposed to do we were doing the civil disobedience we were actively resisting we were standing up we were like voting and it was changing fuck all and so at a certain point we were like we have to rise up in armed resistance against the american state because like nothing we're, we're playing by all the rules that are supposed to work the thorough type rules right and it's not working right and it seems to me like that's part of what your book is saying that that thorough and you know the civil disobedience this is just it's not enough <laughs> well I, I actually want to sort of disavow that i don't i don't have a strong stance on, on social change per se but i want to make a distinction here between what I call defensive actions and uh, and the problem of social change. So defensive action is really an injustice is about to be committed right now against an identifiable person. Like you see the drone taking off to go bomb a village. You see the police officer about to like punch somebody in the head who's already lying, like handcuffed and on his belly. You see whatever it might be. And defensive action is intervening in that moment to stop that particular injustice. But then there's a question about changing the law, changing the structure of government, changing the form of government, changing uh, the way that rules are administered on a mass scale. And that's the problem of social change. Uh, and then there's a question of when, if ever, is violence a good way of creating social change? Um, and to be honest, this is the case where I think it's, it's a sort of an embarrassment in the social sciences that there is not knowledge of how social change works. Um, so I, I, every every year, uh, usually twice a year, in fact, I teach a class on um, like that involves a lot of economic theory, and I'll tell students, oh, economists are almost unanimously in agreement that this these five institutions are vital to having sustained economic growth and having a prosperous society. And then students immediately ask, great, well, if societies don't have those institutions, how do they go about developing them? And the answer is, oh, we don't know. We know it doesn't work. <laughs> we don't know how to actually get there. So I'm, I'm actually really worried that we don't in general know how to create social change and we don't really know. There are lots of cases of violence utterly failing to do it or violence being used in ways that undermine the goals rather than helping. That said, there are a couple on this particular issue about civil disobedience versus violent resistance. Um, when I was researching this book, I read two different books on uh on sort of the black civil rights movement. One was called We Will Shoot Back, and the other is This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. Oh and both books argue that all the stuff that you heard in civics class in sixth grade, where they told you, well, Martin Luther King wasn't violent, you're misunderstanding what actually happened. What really happened was initially black police officers, I'm sorry, white police officers would go and lynch all the black activists. And then the black activists got guns and shot back. And then because they shot back, the white police officers calmed that they calmed down. They started other methods that were less violent and less to oppress the blacks. And then once they got them to kind of like chill out, then they went for strategic nonviolence and all the civil disobedience that you heard about in sixth grade. But none of that would have happened if it hadn't been for a policy in, say, Mississippi and elsewhere of fighting back at first. Yeah, like actually doing the stuff I recommend. So that's at least some evidence that there are cases where, um, and I recommend both of those books. They're really good. Uh, again, uh, this nonviolent stuff will get you killed and we will shoot back. Really good books. Um, that's at least some evidence of a case where, you know, the civil rights movement in the United States depended upon violence. But again, violence for the purpose of creating social change and violence for the purpose of just stopping this injustice from happening right now are very different. So, you know, I would not recommend my view is like if you're smoking pot and an American police officer tries to arrest you for smoking pot, even if the only penalty is going to be you'll go to jail for three days, you're allowed to violently resist. It might not be prudent to do so. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because you'll probably get 
hurt even worse, but it's at least morally permissible. Yeah. Uh, that said, I would not recommend that you go to the DEA and firebomb the DEA headquarters in order to show <laughs> them and get them to rescind the law. That almost certainly won't work. You'll end up killing a bunch of people who are innocent and are not liable to be killed. And it, you know, you should use other kinds of peaceful methods to change that particular law. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that a very subtle point that you make in your book, which I, I thought was wonderful, is that very often when people talk about sort of what bystanders should do and Zimbardo falls into this trap completely. So he not only says that you have a right to intervene. I mean, he, he makes the same point you do I mean, in a kind of a messy, imprecise way. But he goes farther and he says you have an obligation Right, which is what you know. A lot of people do. They jump to obligation, and so if you're uh, a bystander and you see this happening, you have to intervene. And your point is different, right? You say you have a right to intervene, but you don't have an obligation necessarily to. It's if you do it, it's it's a good thing and it's heroic. But it's something you know. The whole part where you talk about Rosa Parks and you come back to it in another place too. But like that, this is something that. You're not obliged to do, right? So, how do? You, what is your point there? Yeah, I think uh, again, this is I think an extension of common sense moral thinking. If if you see something horrible happening and you can very easily stop it at no cost to yourself and you can't be bothered, then we're going to think that that's wrong. So, if you see like a kid drowning in a pool and you can just reach in and save him, and you're like, "Nah, I'm just going to watch South Park instead," we hold it against you, but we if you actually like spend you know every weekend walking around looking for drowning children to save we think that's heroic we don't think you're doing the least you can do i think that's true about um, resistance as well um, resistance to injustice is often extremely costly and extremely difficult uh, so we would hold it to be heroic to do it we wouldn't think it's the least you can do when rosa parks resists we don't say oh yeah of course that's what you're obligated to do anyone who did less than that was acting wrongly we think she's a hero because she went above and beyond the call of duty so what I try to do is go through in that final chapter a number of arguments people might give to try to explain why maybe it would be obligatory, and, and none of them really work. I think resistance, um, def like the rights of defense and so on, these are um, prerogatives that we have, uh, but it's hard to show that you have an obligation to take on a significant risk of personal harm in order to save others. Now, it's different if we're talking about, say, you saving your kids. If someone's attacking your children or attacking a loved one, a person with whom you have a special relationship, you do have a much stronger obligation. I love that you. part. I love that part. Because <laughs> yeah. that's, I mean, because that's, you know, I, I know you don't like Rousseau very much, but there's, I, I really like Emile, and he's got that wonderful line at the beginning of Emile where he says, you know, beware of those uh, those cosmopolitans and philosophers who, uh, you know, find all these duties that they have to people that they don't know. And he says, what is it? The, the philosopher loves the Tartar so that he doesn't have to love his neighbor. Right. So that, yeah. and that's a, your, what your, your takedown of, and I apologize if he's a friend of yours, but like your takedown of Peter Singer was glorious. I mean, like his whole argument about why you should be, you know, giving so much money, you know, every year and the analogy to like a kid drowning. I, I've always felt intuitively, like just in my, in my moral intuition, I've always felt like there was something wrong with that argument. Like it just didn't ring true, but I didn't, exactly know how to i didn't know how to articulate why it felt wrong to me and you articulate this is something you and mike uh, humor do all the time it's like you have you'll sort of have these very very straightforward intuitional like examples which just ring true where you're like that's so fucking true like you know like the, but what you said about how you know if really the proper analogy would be just being surrounded by like all day long you're walking by ponds with kids drowning in them like you can't do anything else you know like what are you going to do with your life right so i yeah. mean you're this is so you say there you really want to bracket off the people that you have special concern for right like your students are important your kids are important your best friend is important your wife is important right yeah yeah. You owe certain people more than you owe others. That's right. And, you know, even Rousseau, it's funny he says that because if you know anything about Rousseau's life, and I know you do, uh, but maybe some people listening don't, Rousseau, like, you know, he, he talks about these special obligations. He certainly didn't live up to that. He had something like <laughs> no. five children that he hit with his uh, housekeeper, basically. Yeah. And then he gave them up, like, a meat, forced her to give them up to, like, an orphanage, which meant the kids died. Yeah. That's what happens when you give them to an orphanage. So, 
you know, he's a nice example of someone who might be a wonderful moralizer on paper and just a horrific human being in person. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's yeah. really one of the worst people ever. <laughs> no, he's he's, he's, a, he's a horrible, he's horrible person. So he might be the worst of them in terms of actual personal character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, he also, he, oh God, we could go on. A, he's, he's, he also started this really, really bad trend of a certain kind of uh, intellectual that sort of appeals to rich people and knows how to is a, kind of a grifter like knows how to play rich people by sort of uh, appealing to their their guilt and to their you know all these he he just was unbelievable at, at playing these people but yeah anyway i mean i agree his personal life guys told monster but he does have some interesting points and he does again and again in emil say that it's it's very important that people recognize their obligations to the people closest to them because that's actually the people that you're you're going to be interacting with most of the time right yeah. so the this idea of kind of a love of you know kind of a john lennon imagine love you know without any borders or any like that that usually ends up i think uh not amounting to anything right it's yeah yeah, and I, it has something to do with what you're talking about, these special relationships, because there's something about love that I'm sure, like, do you, do you have kids? I do, yeah. Yeah, so I, I've got I've got two sons, and, like, you know, I mean, sh I'm sure you recognize this, like, when you, with your kids. It's like, when you have kids, it's like you suddenly have, like, a lot more love to give. It, it's not as if, like, you redirect a bunch of love that was there towards them. Uh, yeah. It's like you suddenly have like more, right? But that love is not um, a liquid asset. Like it can't be just sort of, uh, which is the basic flawed premise in a lot of Peter Singer, in a lot of, you can see it in Plato's Republic. You can, that, that somehow, wouldn't it be cool if we could just take all the love we have for our kids and love all the kids, you know, yeah. that way, which is bullshit. Because like actually, if you try and like, spread it thin it's just not there right well even even if we could have that it would be a disaster in the following way um so imagine like you did have that love for every single kid on earth and every person on earth now think about what happens when like your mom dies or your kids die and how devastating that is and now think of the line from blue oyster cult that forty thousand men and women every day so if every day 40,000 people were dying and you love them as much as your close loved ones, then you would be in, <laughs> all of us would be in continuous paralysis, gripped by horrible grief at the deaths of all of these people, right? Wow. So we can't actually have a system where we all feel that kind of love for each other. Um, we'd have to become somewhat stoic and indifferent to the deaths of people that we supposedly love as much as our own children. Yeah. And this is also, I mean, something you mentioned, and I can't remember what book you, I think, it, is this the one, uh, why don't we give capitalism a chance or what is that? I think it's in that book. Why not capitalism? Why not capitalism? And by the way, great title. <laughs> but, uh, but the, I think it's in that book where you say, this is actually the, the sort of psychological rationale for private property. It's like, the, it's one of the best arguments for private property actually stems from our special relationship that we have with family members that if, when you, when you feel connected to something like it's yours, like, you know, Aristotle's whole notion of like, right, the, the, then you tend to take care of it more. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. Like, which is an exit. It's probably one of the best. You can see this uh, definitely in neighborhoods where you have high home ownership rates. People tend to pick up garbage more. They take care of their lawn. They do stuff, right? And the more you have people just uh, renting and not having a, a long-term commitment to that particular place, things things often fall apart. Right? It's not uh, right. So yeah, no. But so just circling back for a second to that that weatherman question. I mean, like, how would you respond to the? You would just completely disavow the revolutionary argument. I, I, when I say disavow, what I, what I mean is like I honestly don't know. Uh, I don't know what it takes to create social change. Um, I do think like if a person, you know, targeted attacks, like there, there are certain people that are liable to be harmed because of their ongoing participation in injustice, right? That doesn't mean you can like kill the guy who works in the cafeteria at the office. But if there's say a particular organization that's continuous, their officers are continually committing injustice, then in virtue of that, they're liable to be harmed um, in the same way that 
they are for just war theory. I mean, in a sense, revolutionary theory is just war theory. Um, and there's a question about who count as aggressors and what you're allowed to do to them. But there's there's still also a question about even if someone is, in a sense, liable to be harmed, when you're thinking about starting a war, there's a question about the efficacy of that war. What will be the actual fallout of it? What will be the result? What, what will happen after you do it? Will you save the day? So when you think about something like the Iraq War in 2003, as an example, then lots of people, including me, oppose that war. It's not because we think Saddam Hussein had the right to rule Iraq. It's not because we think he had a legitimate government. It was because we thought... If they go and topple him, the consequences of that will be even worse than just letting him last. You know, mm-hmm. thinking, when you think about the tremendous monetary cost um, and money matters, right? That money could have been spent saving lives and it's not. You think about the tremendous amount of civilian death, the tremendous amount of destruction, the civil wars that took place afterwards, the rise of ISIS as a reaction to it. These are things that people who were opposed to that war predicted. Uh, they didn't predict exactly that, exactly how everything went, but they thought this kind of thing will happen. And it might be a bigger disaster to get rid of him than rather than keep him, even though he is not a legitimate ruler. I don't mourn his death at all, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- things like that can happen with regard to internal revolution as well. Revolutions usually fail. Most yeah. revolutions in history have been disasters, even though the governments they overthrew, in a sense, had it coming. Um, and similarly, like, you know, I, I think like a, the DEA, I think, is an evil organization. I they, totally uh, agree. Yeah. Yeah. But... And so I think if a DA agent tries to arrest you for smoking pot or snorting cocaine, yeah, you can resist him. You can hurt him to stop him from doing that. But firebombing the DA is not the same thing. Firebombing the DA is likely to just kill a bunch of people and then cause some sort of like, it, it, it won't change the laws. It won't, it won't stop any injustices from taking place. It won't actually protect anybody. But it will cause them to ramp up the militarization of their agency, for them to spy more on us, for them to uh, do preemptive kinds of rights violations in order to prevent this from happening in the future. So it's it's a really risky thing. Yeah. No, this is why I think a lot of the, the sort of the, the cheap, glib... Uh, Trump Putin analogies just are really annoying because like you're talking about two apples and oranges like on the one hand you have a fundamentally healthy society with a lot of strong institutions and a lot of you know lots of things going for it that momentarily has you know a whack job at the wheel right so you get rid of uh, you get rid of Trump and you replace him with somebody more more sober and more kind of in control of themselves and the United States will be fine. It's not obvious that that's the case with Putin. Like it, it may be the case that at this point in Russia's history, it doesn't have very strong institutions. It doesn't have a lot of, you know, civic society, it doesn't have a lot of stuff. So maybe you get rid of Putin and you get uh, chaos, right? You get yeah. you get maybe something that's that's like a lot worse for the average Russian than what's going on there now right so i well people say like i mean i agree putin's like a you know, terrible putin's russia is not a not a great place at all but i'm not convinced that getting rid of him uh, would immediately usher in like a better russia whereas i'm convinced that getting rid of trump would immediately usher in a better united states <laughs> like yeah. do you know what i mean it's like it's a it, it, important distinction that people don't always make right but so why are you this is another this is a question that I got from three different listeners want me to ask you uh, why are you a libertarian and what do you think libertarianism is because I mean you know Aaron Haspel has that you know wonderful aphorism where he says uh, you know the, the internet consists of five libertarians with you know five different ideas of what libertarianism is <laughs> right so why are you a libertarian and what do you think it is yeah. Well, I wrote a whole book about um, what libertarianism is, including the diversity of thought within libertarianism. Mm-hmm. So you can check out Libertarianism, What Everyone Needs to Know with Oxford in 2012, if you want to get my full answer to that. Um, but that's not meant to just be about me. That's meant to be about everybody in that ideology. Uh, for me, um, I, I think that libertarianism comes from a consistent application of common sense morality without making exceptions for others. Uh, with with only make or at least only making exceptions when there's a really good case for it. So I think of our day to day ethical obligations towards one another are they're not Ayn Rand kind of selfishness stuff. It's we have we, we owe each other in respect. We shouldn't hurt each other. We shouldn't try to impose our will upon other people. We should help each other in various ways. We shouldn't generally force each other to help each other. 
And then if we try to scale that up, um, I don't think there's a strong, as strong of a case for making exceptions to those moral rules at the government level and on this mass level as there is on the micro level. That said, I mean, I maybe there is a case for some exceptions. So I think I also think that liberty works, too. So I th- a lot of it comes down to a kind of consequentialist thing where someone will say, here's a problem that's happening in society right now. And in principle, government could fix it if we give them the power. And my reaction is, yes, you're absolutely right. In principle, they could fix it if we gave them the power. But in reality, the people who will have that power are my neighbors. And if you knew my neighbors, you wouldn't want to give them that power. <laughs> like when you... Uh, when you get like, I, I'm not even that literally because I work in. No, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, uh, you know, no offense to my neighbors too. Like they're fun at parties, but no, they shouldn't be running. They shouldn't be running the country. <laughs> uh, so when you give people power, that power can be used for good. It can also be used to for selfish reasons and to pay off special interest groups and against. You know, the power to save our children is also the power to uh, control our children. And there's going to be a competition to use that power for good and for and for bad. And the people who are going to use it for bad, they have a bit of an advantage. They have an advantage because they lack scruples. They're willing to do what it takes to get that power. So yeah. you have a tendency for the worst to get on top and the power to be used in unjust ways. So you think about like, uh, um, say, a lot of regulations in the United States. Some of these regulations are really wonderful in Canada, too. Some of these regulations are wonderful and they serve the common good. And many of the regulations uh, have the purpose of benefiting a very small set of society at the expense of everyone else. Yeah. Right. So that's that's it. I think I think giving people freedom works better than people think. I think giving government power works worse than people think. And I think that by default, common sense morality is libertarian. And we only can make it should make exceptions if we have a very strong case for it. Yeah, it seems I wanted to sort of test out this sort of argument on you because I, I was trying to explain this to a class because I, I was actually, you know, I, I had a total like sort of salt to Paul moment on libertarianism a few years ago. I, I used to just hate on libertarianism like crazy, right? Because I was one of those like sort of uh, totally egotistical teenagers who got into Ayn Rand and Nietzsche and became utterly obnoxious, right? So, and I, I, so I had this very sort of cartoonish view of what libertarianism was. And then when I actually started reading, it's actually Mike Humer's um, reading him that was the first sort of conversion experience where I was like, wow, this is actually a much more complicated you know, philosophy. And then I read your stuff and you know, a bunch of other people. But uh, it, it seems to me that the difference between, uh, let's say, like sort of conservatives, progressives, left, right, and things like that, and libertarians is that the, the other sort of political ideologies that are out there, they either presume that humans are uh, necessarily that are basically good you know and they're they're sort of corrupted by bad parenting or bad education or you know whatever socialization or they assume that human beings are naturally kind of evil and kind of nasty and that they need to be socialized by these forces and it, it seems to me that the thing that distinguishes libertarianism is that libertarians assume which by the way every ethologist would agree with this that homo sapien sapien is a very hyper-social species, that we're naturally very, very social. So we're good at spontaneously um, organizing ourselves and getting, finding ways to get along with each other, that we can, we'll spontaneously create communities, markets, and, and that you don't really need like a lot of top-down, you, you don't need to like, you don't need to work, work it too much. Like we will naturally figure out how to do this stuff spontaneously. Does that seem reasonable to you? I think that's right. And I want to use that as a, as a reason to plug um, someone who I think people need to read more of, even though she's very famous, but she's not as famous as she should be. Eleanor Ostrom, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics. If you read what her work is about, uh, it, it often takes the form of, of this kind of form, like, according to economists and political scientists and philosophers, in the following situation, it will be chaos and everyone will be at war with one another. And the only way to fix it is if Leviathan comes in and forces people to do things. Or or some economists will say, or you can leave it to the market and the market will do things too. But in reality, in those very situations, she just like gets off, she stops looking at game theoretic charts and she goes and looks out in the world and what she sees is, hey, these hypothetical situations exist out there and people, in fact, solve the problem without Leviathan and also without like having to make everything privatized too. that people do find ways to cooperate and to c- control one another to make sure that they ensure cooperation 
without having to uh, rely upon the only two things that economists and political scientists say work. We're much more complicated than we give each other credit for. Yeah, yeah I think like I, I was a I hardcore like... believer in the whole, you know, free rider problem and, with, you know, the tragedy of the commons. Her takedown of that was it, it was it, it blew my mind. <laughs> like I actually was I had to completely rethink the way like what she talks about the fishermen and how if you have like it really is just a scale problem that if you have like a certain number of fishermen in an area, they will actually govern themselves they don't need a leviathan they will not overfish right yeah but if you get to well you know all this stuff but if you get to a tipping point and you have too many uh, then suddenly all of those you know sort of mansur olson right the the logic of collective action all those like free rider problems that like, kick in when you have that it's really just a scaling problem so if you can yeah. keep communities and to a to a reasonable size then they will actually self-organize quite beautifully without needing to be, you know, have a gun to their head all the time. That's, that, that's a beautiful finding, right? And that, that's ex and that actually, you know, once again, we're, we're animals, right? That's exactly what you would predict of a highly social species, right? They spontaneously organize themselves, right? So it makes sense, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think, I think the lesson here is something like, on a small scale, what you might call civil society is super effective. On a large scale of of strangers interacting, having to cooperate with strangers that they don't see firsthand, that's where markets are most effective. Um, and it, the state, if there's a role for states, it's for the it's they're they're tertiary. They're for what those other two things can't do themselves. But our tendency is once we create a state, the people who are in that state have a very strong incentive to make it primary because their status and their power and their income depends upon um, eliminating markets in civil society um, in order to make themselves the first solution. Uh, so of course, and then political philosophers, you know, we have a strong tendency as political philosophers to be, we're the people interested in the state. We always kind of imagine ourselves in charge of it. So we want that state to have power because we want ourselves to have power. Yeah. Well, we're seeing this ha sort of enacted in real time right now with the legalization of marijuana in Canada. So basically you have like this this market that sort of has been e existing for a while and it's it's stabilized and it's emerged spontaneously and they've taken I mean the amount of money that it passes hands and the all the logistical problems of transportation storage insurance security like everything it's an incredibly complicated economy and it, it emerged spontaneously and it works very very smoothly with uh, in very very little violence very little uh, and and they have high quality product and good price so now with legalization the government's taking it all over and they're realizing that to try and sort of uh, top down set this up is really really complicated like it's it, i mean they're doing it but it, it's very and so far the legal stuff is not the quality is not as good and reliable and the price is much higher than the black market stuff and so they're they're basically they're trying to phase out the black market but they're realizing that to properly phase out the black to implement this, they're they're actually going to have to learn from the dealers, yeah. You know because they've they've ironed out a lot of kinks and they've they've worked out you know how to do this much better than any sort of leviathan could do. Which I, I find that absolutely fascinating. You know, it's, yeah. So, uh, what you're? Yep. Okay. Uh, my producer is telling me that we're going <laughs> we're going uh, way over time. So. Uh, yeah. So any sort of parting comments you want to tell our listeners, any sort of future projects you're going to be working on? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so the main thing I'm doing this coming year is uh, I'm writing a book with a guy named Chris Sopranant, um, about criminal justice reform in the United States. So this is a question about social change. And as you'll see, if you ever, if you end up reading that book, say two years from now, you'll see that my recommendation is not that we go in armed bands and start shooting cops, even though I think it's permissible <laughs> to do so in some cases. Uh, it's going to be about the it's going to be about realigning the incentives. Uh, the reason that American criminal justice is so dysfunctional is not because Americans are bad people. It's not because we're unusually racist. It's because we 
partly because of democracy, we've created systems of bad incentives that bring out our worst behavior. Yeah. Well, I, I buy into the idea, this is sort of Nassim Nicholas Taleb's idea in his new book, Skin in the Game, that, that a lot of the problem is, especially in a place like the United States, is that the people who are making the laws don't have to deal with the consequences of the laws. Right. So, I mean, I saw this when I was living in Baltimore. You'd have these people often, you know, the, the capital city. They're totally disconnected in Annapolis. They're totally disconnected from Baltimore. And they would pass all these ludicrous drug laws and things like that. And they knew perfectly well that if their kids in a in a sort of posh suburb in Maryland or Columbia or something like that, if their kids get caught, they're going to get probation. They're going to get a slap on the wrist. And meanwhile, you have these like poor kids in inner city Baltimore who are getting crazy sentences and stuff like that for drug offenses. So if his point is you can actually fix a lot of problems if you just make sure that uh, the people who are making the policies and laws have to personally deal with the consequences of those laws. Right. So if you want to cut funding to public schools, let's have your kids in those schools, like not your ki your kids. And if you have to deal with that, chances are you'll probably kind of a lot of these problems will take care of themselves. I mean, do you, do you buy that? Oh, I think that's that's true, uh, though. Maybe part of it comes down to the idea that, well, these laws are not for us. They're for them and they're different from us, you know, and it, it's, you know, to their credit, they, sometimes that's that can be right. Like. People might. I remember seeing a thing on Facebook the other day where people are saying, "Well, you think that these people shouldn't buy this kind of stuff, but you buy it." And it's and the person responded, "Yeah, but I make four hundred thousand dollars a year. That's very different. Like I can afford to." But yeah. I think there's this thing like, "Well, people like me, we can do cocaine." You know, like you know, George Bush the second used cocaine, and Obama did pot, and neither one of them did much to like liberate others when they had the opportunity to like reduce the crop, the sentences associated with that. They couldn't be bothered. It seems like both of them had this attitude, well, this is okay for people like me because I'm a winner, but it's for these other losers out there, they need to be disciplined and forced not to because they can't handle it. Yeah. That seems to be what they're thinking. Uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I would love it if, you know, if as, as soon as we decide to have a war, then the Congress people, their children have to go fight in it. Exactly. And exactly. That That's great. Ne, Taleb, well, Taleb's also, he's like you, he's a libertarian, pretty hardcore on that. But he, he says that there should be, uh, his his application of skin of the game goes to so many different things, but he says that when it it you're deciding whether to go into a war or not, only poly elected officials who have direct blood relations that will have to go can vote. Yeah. So you have to be, and if you don't have any blood relation that's going to have to go, uh, you can't vote on that because. And, and he says so many of these policy issues that we stress about clear up. Right. If you if you solve that. But uh, just yeah, I had one more thing really, really quickly. Just your uh, Georgetown is a Jesuit college, right? That's correct. OK. Uh, don't you think the Jesuits and the the Wahhabi school and the various, you know, the, the Protestants and, you know, Plato's. Don't you think they all figured out how social change happens? You basically get the kids and you teach them. Yeah, I think that's right. I think. Um... A lot of it comes down to people get exposed to certain ideas. This, this is what happens to me when people ask me about um, against democracy. They say, you've made a number of practical proposals about things we could do to improve uh, the system. But right now, no one would go for them because they think democracy is a sacred value and you're criticizing it. So what's the point of writing this? And they say, these ideas get out there and they spread. They spread through sort of secondhand dealers of ideas and uh, other kinds of intellectuals. And then what happens is 50 years down the road, people have these ideas in their head. They don't know where they came from, yeah. but they're open to these kinds of changes because they've heard of it. I think, you know, there's this view that like almost all social changes are the result of like inheriting ideas from dead philosophers. <laughs> uh, there's something, I don't want to exaggerate that, but there is something to it in the way that like almost anyone in Canada, the United States, if you ask them philosophical questions about the nature of government, they'll start giving you Hobbesian, Lockean, and Montesquieuian yep. rationales, even though they have no idea who those people are. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's absolutely fact. What's his, I'm totally blanking on her name. It's a Stephen Pinker's wife. She's a philosopher, uh, Goldstein or something like that. I'm blanking on her. But it, she makes this argument in, in her, uh, her last book. She says that actually a lot of the Enlightenment proceeded by argument and, you know, and they 
people did it was ideas that changed things it's just people forgot where they heard the idea in the first place right so yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on the podcast. And, you know, the NSA tried to cut us off so many times, but it didn't work. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I, this was absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And I really would like to have you on the podcast again. We have so many other things to talk about. I, I, this was just scratching the surface. But right. anyway, thank you. thank you for a wonderful book. And have a great Cheers. day. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye.